Son is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. Welcome to our evening services for Sunday, August the 20th. We will sing a few songs. We will observe the Lord's Supper. And I have a message for you that I hope will uh, just uh, uh, edify us a little bit and give us something to think about through the evening. In our church, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. I will give you the number. I will give you the name of the song. If you do not have the that particular songbook, have another one, or you can Google the song to sing with us. That would be great also. So the first song that we're going to sing is number 636. The title is To Love Someone More Dearly. 636. To love someone more dearly. <clears throat> to love someone more dearly every day. To help a child a child to find his way. To ponder or a noble thought and pray. And smile when evening falls. And smile when evening falls. This is my task. To follow truth as blind men long for light. To do my best from dawn of day till night. To keep my heart fit for his holy sight. And answer when he calls. And answer when he calls. This is my task. And then my Savior by and by to meet. When faith hath made her task on earth complete. And lay my homage at the Master's feet. Within the jasper walls, within the jasper walls, this crowns my task. <clears throat> Number 180, Jesus is Lord. 180, Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how he loves me, how I love him, he is risen, he is coming. Lord, come quickly. Alleluia. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to 
carry everything to God in prayer. Hallelujah, 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 Lord come quickly. For the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 382. So if you did not have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, this is your opportunity. 382. We will sing verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2 of this song. Why did my Savior come to earth? 382. <clears throat> Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. Precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Cross won't lift it up because he loved me so. He loved me so. He Precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. We come to the part of our worship service this evening uh, to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. This was instituted uh, at the last Passover, the night in which Jesus was betrayed when he was in the upper room with his disciples. And he explained the, the symbolism of what they were about to do and what they were about to remember. He talked about taking the bread, which would be his body. He would talk about drinking this juice, with, which symbolizes his blood that he would shed. And this came all the way through many years later as the Apostle Paul wrote in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians that he also explained that uh, we would uh, take the bread and we would drink the cup. Uh, the song, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? In the second stanza set asks the question, why did he drink the bitter cup? Well, the answer I think for all of us is so real and so important. He drank the bitter cup uh, for you and I. He drank the bitter cup for the sins of the world. It was a bitter cup of sorrow and of pain and of woe. And the cross that he went to, that he was lifted up, he did it because he loved you and I. 
And so wrapped around the Lord's Supper, as we take of the bread and we take of the fruit of the vine, is all wrapped up around the fact that Jesus loved us so and still does love us so. And so as we partake of these emblems, let's remember the sacrifice that Jesus made once and for all for each of us. Let's pray for the bread. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful that in your divine plan that you sent Jesus to us, that you loved us so much that you did indeed send him to us that we would be saved if we believe in him. As we partake of this bread, we remember his body racked with agony on the cross and know that he went through that agony for each of us because he loves us so. Be with us and bless us as we partake of this bread. We do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Help us, dear God, to understand that Jesus did indeed drink the bitter cup because he loved us so, that he shed his innocent blood because he loved us so. And as we reflect upon this, we understand that the blood that he shed is so very, very important to each of us because it is the blood that washes away our sins. As we partake, let's keep that in mind. We ask this in his most holy name. Amen. As this concludes the Lord's Supper, also on the first day of the week, we are instructed to lay by in store and give those things back to the Lord. We do that because we've been instructed to do it. It was done in Old Testament days as uh, God's people tithed and gave a certain percentage back to the Lord. Their sacrifice was to be one that uh, meant something. Because if we give back and we don't sacrifice, it's not really giving back. We just remember the story of the widow and the this paltry amount that, that she put in the treasury while these rich people put much, much more. And Jesus made the point that she sacrificed as she gave. And that is so very, very important that we sacrifice as we give back to the Lord. And so let's reflect as we give back. Indeed, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and indeed, the Lord looks at the sacrifice that we make, and uh, he blesses us through that sacrifice. Let's pray over the giving. <clears throat> We're just so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that we can give. We're grateful that uh, the church is what you established through your death, and that you are the head of this church. And this church is to go about your duty as the kingdom of God on earth. In order for it to do that, in order for it to attain its purpose in bringing others to the Lord, in order for it to, to meet its purpose in helping those that are in need, uh, money is needed. And that money comes from the people who are within the church. Bless us as we give. Bless those that use these funds, that they would use it in such a way that would it increase your kingdom here on earth. We ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song we'll sing is number 116, God Will Make a Way. 116, God Will Make a Way. <coughs> God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. 
hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. We're so blessed to have the opportunity to sing praises to our Lord. We're so blessed that God loved us so much as we have witnessed in uh, the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And uh, it is just, just so wonderful that we are able to praise the creator of this universe. If you were there this morning, uh, you heard that uh, the title of my lesson this evening would be An Overlooked Work. And I am going to focus on one term this evening. It's a term that uh, we don't use very often, but it is a term that is important to us because it shows, I believe, the negative part of life and the part of life which we are to avoid. The term that I'm going to use is enmity. Okay, enmity. The word is found in the New Testament nine times. It is from the Greek echta, echta. And the general meaning of this word is enmity, hostility hatred. Uh, it comes from within people and it has a, a disposition of opposition to the way God would want us to live our lives. And so these are feelings and even actions of enmity. Uh, if we turn to Galatians, the fifth chapter, Galatians chapter 5, and we start at verse 20. Uh, let's actually start at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Here we go. Enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a list of nasties, isn't it? Those are things that hopefully as Christians, that we have no desire to be involved with. And so in the midst of these deeds, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, strife, jealousy, uh, outbursts of anger, disputes, in the middle of that, we find the word enmity. Enmity indicates a hostility or a hatred. And the meaning I think is a failure to control ourselves, which leads to breaches of behavior that is not loving behavior. It's behavior that's wrapped in strife, disputes, dissensions. These hostile feelings, if they are left unchecked and are not repaired, repaired, will lead us to ungodly behavior. And notice, he forewarns them. People who are involved with such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so this evening, for just a few minutes, I would like to see and examine a couple of ways 
that these enmities might arise so that we might not fall prey to them. Enmities arise in our life when we hold grudges against people. In fact, it can be very difficult to know when you cross the line, you know, from the good side to the bad side. When you, when you harbor feelings of resentment towards someone, perhaps for an offense that we thought that they may have committed, uh, whether it is a real offense or it is an imagined offense. And this will actually ferment into hostile feelings and possibly hostile acts. People do bodily harm to one another because of feelings of this sort. And the old law in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 warns against bearing a grudge. And what this is, is the antithesis of what love is about. If we bear grudges, then the love of the Lord is not in us. The Lord in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, explain to, explains to us what to do when we have a problem with a brother or a sister. It says, if your brother sins against you, go to him. It says to settle this. Don't, don't pull the covers over your head and think that whatever happened didn't happen. Go to that brother explain of what you are upset about so that you can come to some sort of agreement and understand that because this person is your brother or because this person is your sister, that you are to be in unity within the church. And when people hold grudges against one another, unity flies out the window for whatever reason there is disunity within the church one of those aspects might be because people have grudges or ill feelings against one another and let this let this never be because this gives rise to enmity. This gives rise to those hostile feelings, this feeling of hatred. You know how you can take grape juice and allow it to ferment and it turns into alcohol. Well, ill feelings can ferment in that same way and turn into hostilities or even physical or spiritual acts that we will be sorry for. The second cause perhaps of enmity in our lives that they may rise when is when our mind is set on the flesh and not set on God. When we have ill feelings for one another, we have hostility toward God. You say, whoa, 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 I feel that way about my brother. Well, your brother is yours under God. He's your brother in the Lord. And with that, we can't allow our minds to be set on the flesh. Paul contrasts this. And this is what he says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. And he, and he contrasts the old law with the gospel of Christ. And in this context, he reveals a compelling principle. And that principle is this. 
when we fail to live spiritual lives and instead we make our decisions driven by passions or driven by some fleshly inclination, we open up the possibility of enmity entering our lives. Now, with that in mind, we need never to allow this to happen because the only thing will come out of it is things that are not good, things that are bad. Enmities arise through prejudice. Now, you know, immediately we think about prejudice, prejudice, prejudice we think about uh, ethnicity, uh, rich, poor, Jew, in the, in the Bible it was Jew, Greek. We can think, uh, different skin colors, but there's more to prejudice than this. Prejudice is nothing more than a performed opinion. One formed without the facts. Instead, through what I would call insufficient knowledge, irrational feelings, um, inaccurate stereotyping. You know, how often, based on how we think or feel or believe what another person is, do we work ourselves up in a lather against them and allow enmity to rule our hearts. And we just can't do that because that leads to hostility and to hatred and to feelings and then maybe acts. If they go unchecked, they can cause all kinds of problems in our life. And so from Galatians chapter five, uh, starting in verse 18, where we read that list of things that we just don't want to get involved with. We notice that all of these things, all of these things point to uh, God and how we feel about God. In James chapter four, verse four, James tells us that friendship with the world leads to hostility with God. And with that, when hostility, when these enmities are allowed to fester in our lives, we can't please God. God wants us to love our brothers. He wants us to encourage them in love, encourage them in good works. We can't do that as long as there are enmities. And so, as we look at this, uh, we might ask ourselves the question, all right, I'm a Christian. I think I'm doing it right. Am I immune to enmities? And is there an antidote? Now, we all know what antidotes are. We take medicines for certain illnesses. We take antibiotics to treat certain uh, infections. And we trust that they've been prescribed to us and that they will work the way they are supposed to work. So, you know, we're not immune from diseases. We may eat the right foods and do the right things, but we can still get sick. We can still have things happen to us. And this is how enmities can come in and rule our lives. And with that, we come to 
some of the most beautiful Holy Spirit inspired words that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. Because after he wrote about these dealings of the flesh, immorality, impurity, sensuality, I'm not going to go over that whole list again. And he forewarns people, if these are the things that rule their lives, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say, you're not supposed to bear the fruit of enmity. You are supposed to bear the fruit of the spirit. And he goes on to say, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then he wraps it up in a nice package and puts a bow on it. And he says, against such things, there is no law. And in verse 24, he goes on to say, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Why would they do that? And how would they do that? By adhering to the fruit of the Spirit. Love actually seeks and strives for the good in others, not for the evil in others. And if we sincerely give our hearts to loving others, we will hardly have time for hostility and hatred to enter into our lives. That's why uh, in the book of Philippians, uh, uh, Paul says that we ought to allow our minds to fall on certain things. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excel if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, ready? Dwell on these things. When these are the things that we dwell on, then enmity should not have a part in our lives. And it will determine and it will show to all around us that we are led by the spirit and not led by the flesh. I hope this message this evening was beneficial to you. Uh, we want to be people of a spiritual nature. We want to let the spiritual side of us guide us and our love for God, not the enmities of the world. It starts with us dedicating our life to the Lord. We dedicate our life to the Lord by coming by coming his children, by taking Jesus into our life, by confessing him as the Son of God, repenting of our former lives, and being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. If you need that uh, forgiveness, if you need that baptism to become a child of God, we invite you this evening. If it is heavy on your heart, call one of us and we will be there. We will help you to uh, and lead you to down the path that you are to go down. Let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, help us in our lives to strive to uh, have uh, our thoughts on higher planes. Let's think of the good things that we have in life so those bad things can't uh, force us uh, out of the way that uh, we would want to be to live godly lives. Help us to be ruled by the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to dwell on things that are good and honorable. Bless us in our lives, dear Heavenly Father, that we may carry out uh, the mission of your church, your kingdom here on earth, by being the examples to those around us. Continue to be with us, dear Heavenly Father. Bless us and comfort us. I pray that you would just continue to be with those on our prayer list in our church and have them on our hearts and in our prayers. Bless us and help us to be what you want us to be. 
We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. God is the Lord.